I, I would really like to start with people, because in the end, that's what it's all about, and give you a very brief history of the city. So settlements typically started where there was a scarce resource, like a, like a well. And the size of the settlement was roughly limited to the area that someone like that woman could walk with a pot of water on her head, which was around a kilometer. You know? And if um, you uh, think about the, the uh, planet before industrialization, the home and these small villages were really the center of the life. And the home was, was certainly a center of entertainment and energy production and work and health care. Uh, and uh, life was really quite small and intimate back then. If you fly over Germany or, or fly over India, you'll see endless little villages. They're roughly mile, mile and a half apart. Uh, and you, you see then some of these villages growing into cities. This is, of course, medieval Amsterdam. It was almost one, exactly one square kilometer. Uh, and uh, you find countless examples of medieval cities that were the same diagram, roughly a, a kilometer in diameter. This is a, a particularly nice example where you had a denser core. It became a little less dense. Uh, and then you had the wall or, or for security and then the food production outside. And everything needed in life happened in this little uh, village. And then you had... Uh, uh, really hundreds of these settlement patterns evolve over time. And I have a lot of fun looking back. I love maps, so, so I've collected a whole bunch of those. Sorry, in about 10 seconds, I showed you some of my favorites. And, <laughs> and uh, then with industrialization, it all changed. You had factories that were dirty and polluting. They, they moved to the outskirts of town. You had production that became centralized into factories. You had energy production centralized in power plants, health care, in hospitals, learning in schools. You had networks that allowed for this unchecked expansion. You had railways that allowed cities to get farther and farther and connected with, uh, with other settlements. And then it all changed in around 1908 when we got the car. And we, the planet sort of went crazy, particularly in the US, over the car. And this is what we ended up with. So I think, actually, the US is, is the source of a lot of the problems. I mean, we, we uh, particularly in cities like LA, where we went car crazy, uh, we started designing cities for machines rather than cities for people. And you have the sprawl of LA, the sprawl of Mexico City, the sprawl of Riyadh. I took this out the window of my hotel in Riyadh not long ago. It just goes on and on forever. A few high density nodes they're trying to build. You have the tower sprawl of Chinese cities like Guangzhou, but it's the same thing. They're, they're, we're designing places that are fundamentally for machines. And I think this really needs to change. I, I have spent a lot of time in China recently. I think I've had eight trips in the last year or so. And I took this out the window of my taxi cab on a very good day in Beijing. You can see the sign there. It's all green and yellow. There's no red. <laughs> <laughs> and you have, this, you have the same thing in, in Bangalore. I, I took this out the window of another taxi in Bangalore. I was about 10 kilometers from the airport. It took me two hours to get there. I almost missed my flight. And these cities are really grinding to a halt. And it's so refreshing to be in Amsterdam where there's so few cars and so many people on foot and so many bikes. And I think the world could learn a lot. We're also very aware that uh, cars waste land, very, particularly very valuable land. This is, this is Houston a particularly bad example, but everything in red is a parking lot or a parking deck in downtown Houston. Imagine if all that land could be put to more productive uses. Uh, and it's also leading to really an unsustainable environmental degradation. I, again, in Shanghai, I took this out the window of my hotel on an otherwise clear day. Uh, and. And people were saying, Shanghai was good. You should be in Beijing. And uh, they were canceling flights at the airport because of, of uh, restricted visibility on this otherwise clear day. In China, they're building these new ghettos. And, and it's really appalling. I mean, these are brand new buildings 
with relatively expensive apartments, but they are single purpose ghettos. I mean, there's, you know, try to buy a, a toothbrush or an apple in this town. It's very hard. Everything is dependent on getting in your car and, and driving to a centralized area for shopping or for schools or for hospitals. Cities are really important because 90% of the global population growth will take place in cities. I think in Europe already something like 70% of people live in cities. Globally, we've just crossed the rural urban population is equal roughly now. Almost all energy consumption will take place in cities, and cities are really terrific places at their best. They're places of celebration and personal expression, collective expression, like these pillow mob, flash, flash mobs, pillow fight plat, flash mobs that Maria and I have been to a couple of. Um, and it's where almost uh, all the wealth will be created. So cities matter. Whether you live in the city or not, we should all care about it. It's where people find opportunities, particularly women in developing countries and undereducated people. So we're very interested in density. And density is both good and bad. It all depends. So this is, uh, this is some work that uh, Geoffrey West and, and Betancourt did. And you can see these lines that are all pretty much in sync. So the good stuff, research and development, patents, GDP, almost exactly matched with crime and AIDS. And in fact, the, the research now uh, about uh, density points out many of the good things that come with cities, particularly cities with dense urban cores. There are more skilled people, people, higher wages, greater innovation, more science and technology companies, more arts and entertainment, lower water and energy com consumption per capita by a long ways. Uh, but it can also bring more noise, congestion, air pollution, loss of contact with nature, drug use, disease, etc. So a lot of what we're thinking about is how can you have the good stuff that comes with density without all the bad stuff. This is a study that equates um, urban population on this left axis with livability on the right axis. And by the way, I think this is a little bit of a bogus study. I don't really believe these numbers. But the analysis is actually pretty good. Um, it's mostly how they've calculated density. I, I think that's probably wrong. By the way, this was produced by a Singapore outfit. So. <laughs> But the point is you can, you can have high density, high livability uh, communities, and we're very interested in that. So how can we have the good stuff, like Paris, central Paris is over 20,000 people per square kilometer, without the bad stuff that you find in rapidly urbanizing areas uh, such as Bangalore in this case. So we have a number of uh, strategies that we, are, that we think will work, but we are looking for cities to test these ideas. And um, we're interested in what we call living lab experiments to try to validate and iterate until we get it right. So the first is resilient urban cells. Like Amsterdam is a great compact city. Uh, <clears throat> resilient just is this notion that you want to design systems that can bend gracefully and not break when they're stressed, like climate change or energy prices, et cetera. So a, a resilient urban cell is a diverse neighborhood where places of living, work, culture, shopping, play are within a 20-minute walk. And you know the, the central part of Amsterdam is pretty much, pretty much that. And, and the data also shows that the richer the diversity of businesses and people, the more innovative it's likely to be. You, you find uh, a pattern of these network of compact urban cells, resilient urban cells, if hopefully, in places like Cambridge, where I work. So this is Kendall Square and Central Square, Harvard Square, Porter Square. They're all about a mile apart. I mean, there's something fundamental about that settlement pattern that we are very interested in. Paris, a great example, but it could be Vienna or London or any of the great cities. The 20 arrondissements of Paris are about that, that, same, that same pattern. And, and what you find that's different about Paris as compared to all the new Chinese cities that I've been in, is you have a very even distribution of places of, um, of living and work and play, et cetera. I mean, these are all the cafes in Paris. There's almost nowhere in Paris where a cafe is more 
than a two or three minute walk or shops or physicians or pharmacies. In China, they would put all the pharmacies down here in this district and all the housing up here and then connect everything by roads and then make sure there were three parking spaces for everybody because you never know where they're gonna drive and, and make sure everything's connected by a road and make it big enough so it's never clogged and that just does not work. So, we're, so we think that if we're designing new cities you need to start out with that notion that you want at least 80% of what 80% of people need in life within a 10 minute walk. And then when you make a city, it's a network of these compact urban cells. What we show here are the cells connected by trams. These are all the, 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 the sharing facilities. The cars may go around the perimeter, maybe parkings in the middle or at the edges. But, but you, if you do this, you, you start to get to the kind of pattern that I think is healthy and high functioning. You can start to build in great infrastructure. Uh, this is a very American strategy. This is Boulder, Colorado, but it's great. You can drive all from one end of Boulder to the other on a bicycle without ever crossing a street. You dip down below them, you're along the river, and they have bike sharing. These, this is the bike sharing stands here. It's pretty good. In um, Korea, they took down the elevated highway. They reclaimed this river. You can walk basically from one end of Seoul, Korea to the other in this beautiful, tranquil, poetic space with the craziness of Seoul up around you and farther out, there are bike lanes. Um, the High Line in New York City is much the same. All kinds of new infrastructure that we can put in that makes these, we think of them as uh, kind of super highways for pedestrians and, and for bicycles. So how do you study these neighborhoods? Well, we've been, we've been experimenting with toys. We think it's a great way to do it. So we're, we're now using Legos to design cities. Lego just happens to be one of our sponsors, but we'd probably be using it anyway. <laughs> so we, just, we start with a Lego unit. So this, the way we're working, this is 10 meters by 10 meters by one story. That's a Lego unit. Whoop. And you can map then revenue or activities or people or vehicles or even vegetables if you're talking about urban farming to these Lego units. This, the, if it's, uh, we color code these when we design cities. So if it's yellow, it's retail. So there's two workers per Lego unit for a restaurant, 300 customers per day if it's a Starbucks. Housing, this, this little tower here, black is housing, that's 20 meters by 10 meters by 15 stories. So with our units, that's 60 people. So as we build the, the city and ex rapidly prototype these, these designs, we're building with data. We're also building these computational models at the same time, so we're actually building databases. And the process, is, is very quick and very creative. This shows us doing a study of Kendall Square where you can see all the color-coded by function Lego, Lego bricks. And we're, we're able to rapidly prototype these designs. This is in Nansa, which is a new city in China. These are four one square kilometer neighborhoods in a total greenfield site along the river that we, were, we prototyped in one week with a, a little workshop. And they're all using the same number of bricks, basically the same program, but very different designs. And then you can analyze all the data. You can process that in a, in a very interesting way, which I'll talk about in a minute. So that's one, compact neighborhoods. The second thing we're doing it's thinking about mobility on demand, and we define that as where alternatives to the private automobile are more convenient, affordable, and pleasurable, and traffic congestion's essentially eliminated. I haven't seen any traffic congestion here, so. <laughs> <laughs> I got here yesterday, so. <laughs> so who knows what this is here? What? The American, the American Dream, Dream. yes, exactly. <laughs> so everybody has two cars and a house and a milkman and a dog, you know, and a family and picket fence and all that. That's, that's breaking down very rapidly. This is an article in the, in the Atlantic. Uh, I don't like the name, the cheapest generation, because I think that's missing the point, the title of this article. But it, what it's really getting at is that young people are moving away from ownership. They're moving away from owning cars, owning houses, owning CDs, owning books, and it's really about service. And it's not about brands, and uh, and this will this will change everything. 
Uh, the Economist uh, a couple of months ago had this the sharing economy on the cover. I really believe in this. I see this is this is the way young people are living today, particularly my students at MIT or the Harvard students we work with. So you guys started in in one sense with your with your white white bicycle program. I know it didn't quite work out like everybody hoped, but I would say the technology wasn't really ready at the time and the business models and all that good stuff. But it, it really in some ways did start here. This is how we think of mobility on demand. It operates in this compact urban cell. The most important one is walking. So you design it so you privilege that mode like you guys do here in Amsterdam. You introduce shared bikes. This is in Amsterdam, it's Copenhagen, but, and they don't actually do much with sharing either, but in, in, in the future, I think that will increasingly happen. Uh, we've developed these four new modes at MIT. This is the, the Green Wheel project with an electric hub motor that can convert a bike into an electric bike. Uh, this is what we call a PEV. That's a persuasive electric vehicle to encourage people to change modes and to get more exercise. A little three-wheeler, I'll talk about that in a minute. This is uh, the robo-scooter that folds, a little electric scooter in the city car. So, but all together, this is mobility on demand. So you, it's all shared. You have a single way of accessing all of these modes. By the way, this is trams or buses. This is really important. I think we'll get away from fixed route, heavy infrastructure, mass transit, and more agile on demand. But we could talk about that if anybody's interested. So let me drill down a little bit into what we're doing. So this was the robo scooter that we did. It was uh, funded by a Taiwanese company. They, they, we worked with them to prototype it, the green wheel that I mentioned that uh, it's got hub motor and wireless communication. Um, we're we're in, uh, in China quite a bit, as I mentioned, and I'm very aware that you have poor people moving very quickly in the bike lanes, often in these three-wheel vehicles, and you have the middle class and rich people sitting in traffic in their Audi A6s next to them. And we, we think we need to figure out ways to get middle class people and literally everyone in, into bike lanes. And that's a stretch in China. But you can see these, these little uh, three-wheel vehicles. This is, uh, this is our persuasive el vehicle, electric vehicle. And, it, and it's really designed to democratize access to bike lanes. You don't have so much of a problem here. But in uh, the US, only young males in stretchy pants drive on drive bikes in the city, <laughs> for the most part. And so we need to, we need to get. Um, Elderly people, women in skirts, businessmen, you know, the, everybody using the bike lanes, we think this is one way to do it. And in the process, we hope we can address the problem of energy congestion, mobility, aging, and obesity simultaneously. We designed this to meet the EU regulations for a bike lane vehicle. We think social biking is really key. So a lot of people that don't use bikes, we've found through some of our research, we have data to back it up that if you bike with other people, that you're more, more likely to sustain it and use it for commuting and for pleasure. And uh, we're just about to sign an agreement with a Chinese manufacturer of electric bikes to produce this. So stay tuned. The design's quite a bit different. We actually have a car-like air-conditioned version of it for China because we think they have to take that as a first step. This is, uh, this is our city car. So... We got rid of the useless things like engines and transmissions. We put all the complex stuff in the wheel, so we have drive motor, steering, braking, suspension all in the wheel, and the, um, it folds. It's all drive-by-wire like a modern airplane. Uh, it folds because you can go nose into the curb, and the length of the vehicle is then the width of a conventional car, so you can get something like three and a half vehicles to a conventional car in this parallel parking. Uh, scenario. The door opens, you can step right out, it sort of crouches down, so it's great for older people to get into. Everybody thought this was a wacky media lab idea, but we, we have one of our sponsors who is, we worked with for 18 months to commercialize it. You see the, this pivots from left to right, so the yoke, it's all hand control, so you can drive it in London one day and Paris the next. They, um, they maintained all of the core features of the car. Um, 
And so we're very happy. We launched it in Brussels at the EU headquarters. It was cited as one of the great social innovation projects linking the US and, and uh, Europe. A lot of this was EU funding. This is our sponsor giving me a thumbs up. So we like, we like happy sponsors. We have about 75 corporate sponsors at the Media Lab. So we like to engage with companies because that's the only way we can get these things out into the world. That is an old archive project in, a, in, in effect right now. We're on to version 2.0. And that will be autonomous. We don't, it won't be like the full autonomy that you, you read about for the Google car. We think that it should be shared use, electric, um, autonomous vehicles where uh, what's automated, what's autonomous is the pick up and drop off. You can drive it when you're in it. We don't care about that. But it should come to you. You can get out of it wherever you want, and then it goes on its way, and it can charge itself and, and balance the system ro robotically. We think that's the future for cities. So one of our students said, well, if you have all these driverless cars running around, how do you know that the car won't step in front of you? So um, we were, actually Dan told us today that if you or in a, in a crossing a bike line, you make eye contact with the oncoming bike. And then when you, when you each see each other, you know it's time to go. Let me play that again. So, we've, so we decided that the vehicles without drivers need to, needs to communicate with you in a very natural way. In effect, it makes eye contact, or we can throw directional audio, or it can change colors, or since we can fold, it can crouch down and be submissive. And we've been trying all these things. And, and what we've... Uh, what I loved about that project is, is it's a problem that doesn't exist yet that our graduate students decided to solve. Ultimately, uh, this is what you end up with when vehicles get autonomous. What we wanted, you know, humans are, are, are a nightmare. <laughs> 35,000 Americans, 1 million people annually, globally, uh, get killed by cars. And we need to get humans out of, it's crazy to have a drunk or a stoned human driving a 3,000 pound car. And uh, with this, we will, with this will take, the transition will take place within 10 years. I, I'm quite convinced of that. First of all, it's simpler. You get rid of traffic lights. Vehicles can be very lightweight and very efficient. And best guess is you will reduce accidents by a factor of 10. We'll see. So <laughs> the third innovation is... Uh, what we think of as living space on demand. Now, these are hyper-efficient micro-units that are fun, affordable, productive for young professionals in the creative heart of the city. It's getting very hard for young people to live in the cities where young people want to live. The cities that are the most innovative are where the housing prices are the highest and young people are getting priced out of the market. It's a real dilemma for our mayor, Mayor Menino on the left, or Mayor Bloomberg on the right. Both are advocating micro-units. Um, the problem is they're very badly designed and young people don't want to live in them. So we are we think we can do better. So we're taking the same idea of the robotic wheel where we integrate all these complex technologies into a prefabricated package. And in this case, we can dynamically transform the apartment from working to sleeping to guest rooms to dining to partying. This, by the way, is our 600 square foot ultra uh, extra large apartment. Um, you know, it's really silly to have a bedroom that's unused during the day and a, and a, and a living room that's, that's too small. So we're, we're, we're working now with market rate developers to, to try to figure out how we can do this in a very cost-effective way with a great value proposition. That's an old video, but this, these are some of the studies that we're now doing for a Manhattan developer who wants to build a 36-story tower at Penn Station. Uh, this is our big apartment. So you see you have a king-size bed, a living room, a dining table for eight, and a study. And then you have a guest over, and it goes to a, two king-size beds, or the whole thing opens up, and we have six or seven other states. This is the, the rendering of that apartment where the wall comes forward and the door shuts. And with a few simple interventions that we think will make this work. This is a... Uh, what is it, 28 square meter apartment that has a huge living room, bigger than you'd find in most uh, three bedroom apartments. But then it converts to a bedroom and then it converts to a dining room for 10 people all in one space. Uh, so we've, 
it's, it's easy enough to do these kind of designs, but we have to actually make the technology work. So we're prototyping in our lab very natural ways that you can move a very heavy wall as naturally as opening and closing a door or as elegant as uh, moving an icon on an you know, iPhone app. We've, we, like uh, I said, we believe in testing these ideas with people. So this is an apartment that we built where we have people living. And what we found is particularly the young people, when they go back to a conventional apartment, their reaction is, well, why can't I just move that damn wall out of the way <laughs> when I need the space? All right. Um, Number four, so we believe in shared co-working facilities. We visited a co-working space, an incubation center today, where you have shared co-working cafes and fab labs and other facilities that support innovation and entrepreneurship. So cafes and shared desks. This is the Cambridge Innovation Center, where there are 450 startups, where they, they actually rent each spot out to three people, because on average, people are there a third of the time. And uh, we've worked a lot in Helsinki with Alto University, and they have the design factory with shared shops and fab labs and electronics lab. This is all the future as part of the sharing society. Number five, urban food production. A year ago, I wasn't, this wasn't on the top of my list. This is rapidly rising right to the top of my list. Uh, and we define that as where urban agricultural systems efficiently deliver high quality produce and fall, solve food security. And I, I would add water scarcity problems in the process. So I'm an urban farmer. This was one Sunday's yield about a month ago. And I have 22 varieties of heirloom tomatoes in my little urban garden. That's, that's our dog right there. This is my garden with Brussels sprouts. But you know, this is a lot of fun. I love this, but it doesn't scale. So this is not the future. You know, people growing in dirt is not the future. You can't feed a Chinese city of 20 million people this way. We have to find a different way. And um, if you source where food comes from, this is London, you could do the same thing for Boston or Amsterdam. You know, it's, it's insane how far we ship the things that we eat, and we have to do a lot better. This is just a screenshot from a website saying food security is the most dramatic problem facing mankind. You can find other articles that talk about water scarcity is the most dramatic problem. This is uh, what you see when you fly over the desert, this kind of, uh, I think, insane industrial agricultural system. That does not scale. That's not the answer. So we're looking at aeroponics and hydroponics does everybody know what aeroponics is? Nobody? It's, it's basically taking conventional plants, putting them in a chamber, misting their roots with a very careful solution of nutrients, spritzing them every minute and a half or so. And, and the roots end up like this. And it's, it's pretty interesting. We're now put, uh, prototyping a next generation system in our lab that's my graduate student there on the left. You can see the growing chambers where all the plants are, are growing. And, and what we're finding is that you, it, you actually can produce 97 times the vegetables in a given area of land with this technology. You stack things vertically like this. Use 90% less water, 93% less CO2, and 60% less fertilizer. Ultimately, this is what we think we should get to, which is having these very thin, lightweight chambers that can be appended to buildings, particularly the end walls where you have vertical circulation, fire stairs, and elevators. And we calculate that somewhere between 10 square feet and 20 square feet will feed one human. That means that kind of food production can feed thousands and thousands of, of people. We also think you can have personal gardens. This is a little system that we prototyped in our lab that could be in your apartment. Lots more to say about that. But for me, that's a, that's a top priority. Resilient energy. That's another area where microgrids locally produce renewables, create agile, adaptable, efficient energy networks. This is Manhattan last year when there was a blackout. And um, this is anything but a resilient energy system. We had, a, we had a blackout in part of Boston not long ago. We think each one of those little neighborhoods, that's roughly uh, Greenwich Village right there. That, 
uh, Chelsea, Greenwich Village. That should be, each one of those should be a resilient energy network. So we've been working with some companies to figure this out. And if you do it right, you can have a DC bus for the homes. All the, you know, the devices we use for the most part now are, D are DC. You can go directly from renewable energies to this uh, DC bus. You don't have to do the conversion with the wall warts, the AC adapters that plug in. When you, when you have sufficient electric vehicles, you can take the used batteries from the vehicle and you can put them in a battery storage and that becomes a fixed energy buffer so you extend the useful life of energy uh, of, of uh, Automotive batteries, we're working with Schneider Electric to try to develop that vision. We're also um, doing a lot with, with understanding flows of energy and thermal comfort in buildings. This is our media lab where we put hundreds of sensors to understand in a very fine-grained way the state of the environment, the um, <clears throat> patterns of behavior of the occupants. We even have Twitter feeds, etc. What you see here where it's colored uh, uh, red, that's higher temperature than the set point of the thermostat. When it's blue, it's lower temperature. So we are, I think, for the first time, getting extraordinarily fine-grained detail about um, our physical environment. But then we can use that kind of information and develop what we think of as responsive technologies. These, these are, we think of this as innovative systems and trust networks that enable powerful new applications that improve the life of each citizen. Now, Trust Networks, it's a project we're, we're working on at the Media Lab. It's something like uh, wire transfer of funds, the, uh, the SWIFT code technology, et cetera, where, you, where companies can check out your data with your permission and use it for an application without you worrying about that uh, being compromised. And I think here in Europe, you all are w ahead of us in the US in thinking this through and uh, sort of data bill of rights that, uh, but I think you know, a lot of the attempts are to block the use of data. That really is not the future. We have to figure out ways that data can be used without compromising people's privacy. This is uh, a project we're doing with Siemens right now where we have these tunable LED lights. Blue light is about 30% more efficient than white light. We have a sensor network that's, that's, that's detecting, at, not occupancy, but activities, office activities. And then we can map each of those activities to different lighting states. This is a living lab experiment we're now doing at the Osram Sylvania lab outside of Boston where people have been living with this. And you can see as they go about their activities, the light is dynamically changing. So we're, the study is two things, to see how much energy we can save. You see it recognizes the paper, the desk lamp goes up, goes on. She picks up her phone, the red light goes on. It goes subtly red at the, at the entry to signal. It's maybe not a good time to to be interrupted. We're also looking at the acceptability of this and do people like living in these environments with dynamic light changing and of course what we found is young people love it and baby boomers hate it but anyway we're still working on <laughs> we're still working on that. So then we thought well if we can do that maybe we can do it with sunlight. So this is a, an articulating mirror at the facade of the building that will throw a shaft of sunlight deep into the space and so here's the mirror. It's sort of ugly. It's a kind of a crude prototype, but it could be turned into a beautiful system at the facade. And here she picks up the phone and she um, positions that shaft of sunlight where she wants it uh, when she's engaged in a particular activity like cooking at the, at the kitchen counter. And then she can map that activity to that spot of sunlight. If she does that with multiple activities, then the sun will follow her around during the day. And by the way, then you can shade all of the glass on a hot day except for a small aperture and really reduce the cooling loads. We've also designed these little wireless accelerometers that you can wear, which is streaming directly now to this mobile phone. It's doing activity recognition and calorie counts on the phone. And what we proved here is you don't need a computer. You don't actually need a network in the loop. You can do everything on these mobile phones, which have now become these very powerful computers. So we're very interested in all that. So those are some of the systems we're thinking about. But recently, I decided that um, that wasn't good enough because we didn't really have a good way to communicate these ideas to 
uh, and, and to get them in front of the, the stakeholders and the decision makers. So we decided that we needed to build a new platform, a kind of a decision support system. We think of it as da a data-driven tool to understand human dynamics and complex urban interrelationships for decision making. So we have a project right now to look at uh, Kendall Square, where MIT is, as the kind of ultimate uh, high density innovation hub, where we're going to add in this one square kilometer area 37,000 uh, apartments for 37,000 people. The politicians would never let us do this, but we're going to test uh, how well that works. And in the process, we want to get to something like this. I don't know how many people saw Avatar, but this was a great vision of a three-dimensional decision support system that integrated all this complex information that um, allowed these people to do evil things in the movie. But we think that... <laughs> But I th we think that you can do the same thing now with city design. So this is our little baby step towards that. So we took our Legos. We have a projection system. We can project on any of the surfaces. In that we have about nine high-definition projectors here. And then we can simulate all kinds of complex urban flows. And we can. And the beautiful thing about it is people can stand around and discuss it. And we can toggle on and off all these different simulations. I shot this video last Friday just before I left. So this is really a work in progress. This is actually two weeks worth of work now in this workshop. By the end of the year, we hope to have some really, really good stuff. This is uh, using the same systems to do shadow studies. And you can see the, actually the urban farming projected on the facades. These are, there's no real light source here. This is all being done computationally. And uh, we're quite excited about this prospect. Uh, Hiroshi Ishii at the Media Lab does this wonderful work with new interfaces. So this is a tool that he built that with, with these little Lego-like blocks, but you have these actuators that raise them up and down. And uh, although it's very low fidelity now, we think ultimately we can dynamically change the physical form of the model uh, over time. And we'll be, we'll be co collaborating this term to try to figure out how to, how to do this. This is a really kind of a wonderful project. But they know nothing about designing cities or architecture, so we'll, <laughs> they're just expert at designing interfaces. So that'll be, that'll be a lot of fun. So anyway, the CityScope project, these are all of the, the things that we think we can ultimately get to. We can, we can simulate people and movement of vehicles and energy flows, wind flows, solar access, building facades, even get down to predict, predicting livability, maybe do a heat map of, of innovation, you know, that where areas where, that, are, that are conducive to supporting innovation and interaction, maybe predict crime. Uh, my, Sandy Pentland, my computer scientist partner in this project, he's interested in all these lower things because they're harder to do and he's uh, challenged by those kind, of, those kind of problems. And I think we'll be able to get to this within, within the next year. This is just an example of Sandy's work. So he did, uh, here, every little moving dot is a mobile phone moving in a taxi cab. And, and the dots that grow are pick up and drop off points, which are, which are common. And what Sandy, this is all looking at nightlife behavior of people in San Francisco. So then he processes all that data and clusters them according to membership in nightlife tribes, and there, which are color-coded here, and then maps that back onto the city so where you can see where, where people actually live. And there are all kinds of ways then to follow up with other uh, information sources to profile people. Uh, and what you find is that People in the same tribe tend to buy the same phones, and they tend to have the same diseases, and <laughs> they go to the same restaurants. And all of this information, if we can solve the trust network issue, can be used to do marvelous things for people. Ultimately, um, we want to get rid of these kind of static models in cities. We, this is Shanghai, but most cities in China have, has a, probably Amsterdam has one. Boston has a model like this. Um, New York City does, but they're static. They don't show systems. You can't understand the flows of, of things. We think we can replace them with these much more dynamic models. But in the end, what we have to remember 
is that cities are all about people. Amsterdam's one of the great walkable, livable, human-scaled cities uh, in the world. I shot this yesterday, in case you're wondering. <laughs> and, uh, and I think the world has a lot to learn. But I think uh, that what happens you know, in old cities like Amsterdam, it's really hard to change things. So the, what would be fantastic would be to be working with new greenfield cities in China you know, in a, in a mature city like Amsterdam with all these, the beautiful history and culture. And I think the two together will get into some interesting cross-fertilization. So thank you.